crucified wasn't just to suffer physically. It was also a, a social death in a world where your honor was as important as how much money you had. To be crucified was to be stripped naked, displayed for everyone to, be, to see in your weakness and in your suffering, and to be stripped of all honor, to be utterly humiliated. And that's what we're celebrating this morning. An innocent man being brutally tortured and utterly and completely humiliated. Why? Well, from the beginning, Jesus' disciples remembered his death and said that wasn't just a random event, that wasn't just something that he suffered, but he chose that and he did that for us, and specifically for our sins. So the question is, what's the connection between Jesus dying that way on the cross and our sins. Often we don't really think a lot about ourselves as being particularly sinful. Uh, and we may not come to church uh, feeling like we need a whole lot of sins to be forgiven. Uh, but the backdrop to the cross is God's purposes for creation. God intended his creation to be a harmonious place, a life-giving place, and it's not in a lot of ways. The world we live in is a world that in many ways is out of joint, dislocated. There's lots that's good and beautiful in the world, but wherever we go, we also see pain and suffering. We see injustice. And when we talk about sin, we're recognizing that the world isn't the way God intended it to be, and we're implicated in that. We're part of the reason for that. And there may be some of us for whom uh, we can look at our lives and say, oh yeah, I've done some really awful things. But there are probably some of us who look at our lives and say, well, I'm not that bad a person. I've lived a pretty good life. And we can become better people. We can grow to be more like God wants us to be. But there still remain the seeds of that violence and brokenness in us that are the same motivations, the same impulses that create all kinds of destructiveness in our society. When I think about little moments as a parent, you know, when I'm tired at the end of the day and my child needs my attention and I brush him off because I just don't feel like talking to him and I don't realize that that moment of brushing my child off and not giving them that attention hurts him deeply and maybe has long-term consequences for our relationship. Little moments of self-centeredness, little moments where we lack compassion, those moments can cascade into all kinds of, of pain, all kinds of destructiveness in our relationships. And so in little ways like that, even when we are good people, we're still part of what is wrong with the world. We're still part of the problem. And that's what we talk about as sin. It's the fact that we, in little ways or in big ways, reject sometimes the way of life that God created us for. We reject the purpose of our lives. And instead, we decide that we know better, or we decide that we just don't want to do what God wants for us. That God's design for a life-giving creation isn't important enough to us, 
our immediate gratification is more important. And so our, our sin isn't just hurting the people around us, it's also denying the reality of who we are as God's creation. We're saying, no, God, I don't owe my being to you. God, I, I don't uh, recognize that your design for the creation, your design for my life is perfect. No, I think my design is better. Well, that's denying who God is. And it's denying the very reason we were created. Denying the one who, every breath we take, gives us our being as our creator. That's sin. And the New Testament tells us, that the early disciples told us that Jesus died this horrible death. Jesus accepted this utter humiliation to deal with that problem in us, to deal with the fact that we are part of the problem in the world. Because what God's about is healing creation. What God's about is putting an end to violence, putting an end to destructiveness, and bringing the world eventually back into its ideal patterns so that we can enjoy life the way it was meant to be lived. But in order to do that, we can't bring with us all of our baggage of rebellion against God and of selfishness and of violence. So how does the cross solve this problem? There's something mysterious about the cross. And it, to a certain extent, we'll never completely understand what happened in that moment when Jesus died. But the New Testament writers give us a few metaphors that help us to understand pieces, aspects of what Jesus did on the cross. And one of those metaphors is to say that Jesus on the cross was a sin offering or was a sacrifice like the sacrifice of the Day of Atonement in the uh, Israelite temple. What does that mean? Sometimes we think of it in terms of uh, a payment, uh, like Jesus was paying a price that we incurred like a fine for our sin. But that's not actually the way ancient people thought about sacrifice. Sacrifice was just understood to work. In the whole ancient world, people thought about the death of an animal, the death of a living thing, as having power. The act of killing something had power. Something happened when you offered a sacrifice. And so when God related to Israel and offered Israel a, a way to relate to him, God took up those basic beliefs that were so universal in the ancient world, that, that killing an animal did something powerful. And he said, okay, I'm going to use these symbols in order to speak to you, in order, in order to let you speak to me. And so if you had asked ancient Israelites, um, why does sacrifice work? When you offer a sacrifice for your sin, why does God forgive you? They would have said, well, because it's a sacrifice. And sacrifices work. Sacrifices are powerful. Uh, that was enough of an explanation. And so when we look for more of an explanation for how sacrifices work, we're often really asking the wrong questions. The, to say that Jesus' death was a sacrifice was to give an answer to how it worked because the assumption was just that sacrifices were powerful. And so when we sin, when we are violent and selfish, when we reject God, we break something sacred. And in order for something sacred that's broken to be healed, sacrifice has to happen in the ancient mindset. And the sacrifice is the powerful act that heals those broken relationships, that heals those broken sacred bonds. The sacred bond between us as human beings and our creator. 
So when the New Testament authors say Jesus' death was like a sacrifice for our sins, they're saying something powerful happened when Jesus' blood was shed that was more powerful than any other sacrifice that was offered in the, the temple. And if sacrifice was all about restoring sacred things that had been broken, the sacrifice of Jesus could restore completely that broken relationship with God, that broken trust. So that's one dimension of what happens on the cross. Jesus is a sin offering for us. He's a day of atonement offering for us. And that means that for those of us who trust him and follow him, he's already performed this powerful act of sacrifice that heals our relationship with God no matter what we've done, no matter how we've violated that relationship. But that wasn't the only metaphor that early Christians used. You know, an even more common metaphor was to talk about Jesus as the Passover lamb. And we often don't notice that this is a very different picture than the picture of Jesus as a sacrifice for sin. Because the Passover lamb wasn't a sacrifice in the temple. If you remember the Exodus story, Israel was in slavery in Egypt. And Pharaoh, the, the Egyptian ruler, wasn't letting them go even though God had sent plagues against him. Pharaoh kept saying, yes, I'll let them go and then changing his mind. And so God decided to pull out all the stops and to force Pharaoh to let the people go. And his plan was to have an angel come into the city and kill the firstborn in every household uh, of the Egyptians. And that was the destruction that was going to set the people free. But the angel of death had to know not to kill the firstborn in the Hebrew houses. And how would they know that? Well, God told the people to kill a lamb and to roast it and to eat it and to, to have a meal together as a family, but to take some of the blood and to mark their doorpost with the blood. And when the angel of death came to their house, they would, the angel would see the blood and know that this was a Hebrew house and not come in and kill anyone, but would pass over that house and go to the Egyptian house. This is the metaphor that early Christians use more than any other for the cross because they understand that there's a new exodus event that God is bringing, that the whole world is in slavery. We're in slavery to death. We're in slavery to violence. We're in slavery to sin. Things aren't the way they're supposed to be, and we can't get ourselves out of it. And God says, a day is coming when I'm going to put things right, and that's going to mean, unfortunately, destroying and getting rid of all of the th evil influences, all of the, the destructive influences that would corrupt the good creation. That's what God's judgment means. Clearing away the garbage so that creation can be made whole again. Just like God needed to bring destruction to the Egyptians to set the Israelites free, he needs to bring destruction to evil in the world in order to bring creation out of its slavery to sin and death. But in Jesus, we have a Passover lamb. And when we trust him and follow him, it's like the blood of Jesus is put on our doorpost, marking us as God's people so that when that future day comes and God puts the world right, we won't suffer the destruction. And the assumption is that we won't suffer the destruction because we've chosen to try to learn to be God's people. And God is giving us 
space to learn how to live the way he meant us to live in the first place. He's giving us time to learn to live the way he meant us to. And eventually, he will perfect us. He will remove the, the impulses to violence and destructiveness that, that corrupt us. But that begins, that space for us to learn, that space for us to grow, that space for us to move toward our promised land begins with Jesus as the Passover lamb, marking us as his own so that we're not just destroyed when God gets rid of evil in the world. So here are two metaphors that the New Testament uses. A, a sin offering, a, a powerful act that heals a broken, violated relationship, and the Passover lamb, a, a death whose blood marks us so that we're protected from destruction and can be liberated from slavery. There are other metaphors that are used too. And the variety of metaphors, I think, points again to the fact that there is something mysterious about the cross. None of these pictures of the cross answer all of our questions about it. But what they all agree on is the result. That somehow because of what Jesus did, because of his suffering, because of his humiliation, we get a chance to not be rejected by God, to not be kicked out of God's perfect world, but to be taught, to learn, to grow, until we're ready to be part of God's perfect creation when he puts it right. The one other thing that the cross shows us is how profoundly God loves us. He didn't have to do any of this. You know, the story of the flood and Noah's ark in the Old Testament uh, shows us what God could do. He could just wipe all of us out and start fresh. But he chooses not to. He chooses to work with us even though we're broken, even though we rebel against him, even though we deny our own creator. He chooses to work with us. And he doesn't even just choose to work with us from a distance. He came close up to us in Jesus because God was present in Jesus. And he didn't just come close up to us and do something easy, even though he could have. God chose in Jesus to come close up to us and to suffer the depth of our suffering to be humiliated as profoundly as we sometimes are humiliated. He chose to rescue us in a way that meant he took on and shared our deepest pain and shame. That is love. That God would choose to suffer for us so that we who don't deserve it can be set free and can move into that promised land of God's restored creation. And so that's what we celebrate this morning. We remember the utter horror of what Jesus went through, but we celebrate the powerful rescue that Jesus enacted in that horror. And we celebrate the love that he proved for us when he hung on that cross. Amen.